It's not the first time we've seen the PC-104 form factor here, but I thought this one was worth a look, purely because it uses an SOC that doesn't get mentioned very often. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and uh, yeah, PC-104, we have looked at it before, and I guess we'll have a look at it again today. It's a different SOC on this one, uh, apparently. And, well, yeah, I never tested it before I had one of these. I mean, it's not something you run into on desktops, certainly. Although they did appear on some more conventional form factor boards. I guess we'll talk about that later. And, uh, yeah, as usual, other things I'll talk about at the end of the video. One of them, uh... Well, anyway, we'll get to that. Now let's get on with this thing for now. To be clear from the start, I've talked about both PC-104 and industrial embedded systems in the past, so to prevent this video becoming excessively long for no good reason, I'm not going to be covering most of that again. You can look in the description or the little i button thing on the side of the video if these things still exist by the time you watch this, and you'll find previous videos there. Still, for those not familiar with the PC-104, we'll uh, go over it quickly. It's a form factor which goes back a long way. It's encroaching on 30 years old now, though there were some similar form factors around before that were probably manufacturer-specific. To all intents and purposes, you have a PC on a little card which you can stack with other cards using the same buses. While said buses might look strange at first, they're generally not anything special, and in our case, it's quite literally just ISA. Pretty much all common PC buses have existed on PC-104 cards at some point or another. Today, PCI Express is available, for example. The form factor hasn't largely changed, but I think you can only have certain combinations of these, and they do still make them with ISA. Now, as you might imagine, whilst there are versions with traditional CPUs like you'd find in a desktop or a laptop, this isn't necessarily very practical, and as time went on, cards came with system-on-chip solutions more often, like the, what we have here today. These tend to be quite hard wiring, and these systems often find themselves in use for industrial automation, or equally similar tasks. Our system here today was made by Arbor Technologies for that particular line of work. It's not designed to be particularly fast or flashy, but to do its job, and to do so consistently, without breaking down. This one isn't as well integrated as some of the others, because of that rather bulky looking silicon motion video chip stands out, so it isn't part of the SOC. However, it can run a VGA monitor, and it has an LCD controller built in, so it's still perfectly serviceable for what this machine's meant to do, and it doesn't get very warm. It won't be the fastest thing on the planet as far as video goes. In many cases, cards like this use the host system's RAM as their frame buffer, but that generally won't matter on this kind of thing because graphics aren't going to be particularly important. In fact, quite often these machines spend their whole life in text mode. And when I say frame buffer, it quite literally is just a frame buffer. It's just something to keep the RAM deck fed or keep the LCD fed because I guess you wouldn't have the RAM deck going for that. On the subject of the host system's RAM, the card has 32 megabytes of SD RAM soldered onto it. That's what you get. You can't upgrade it or anything, but it's more than enough. It's fairly standard, that amount, actually, for these 486 class ones. I kind of dislike how Arbor used these coin cells that look like rechargeable ones, but apparently aren't, so naturally our bias settings won't save anymore, because that's gone flat. At least, I, if they are rechargeable, I've not had one that works, and you're just going to have to solder a new one on, which I guess isn't a big deal, but it sort of seems to go against the design. I guess I'm in two minds, because it's not a moving part, but I don't know. I don't really like that. Beyond that, there's a Realtek network interface. It's fairly standard. It's the same one you'd get on a PCI card in a desktop. The SOC does have PCI, but it's not exposed as a bus on this thing. I guess you just wouldn't need it here. It has uh, enough serial ports and parallel, which is good, because you're going to probably need those. There's also USB and PS2, not to mention we get an IDE interface and a floppy interface. And the IDE interface is connected to the PCI, so it's actually quite fast. Under that heatsink is the SOC, containing the CPU, FPU, memory, bus controllers, as well as Super I.O. 
a load of other things. Actually, the IDE controller's in there, but it definitely is interfacing on PCI, or at least the, the host best let the PCI is on. This SOC is the ZF Micro ZFX86. These are based on the ever popular 486. There have been several versions of it, and this particular one is the older 100 MHz version. Curiously, Arbor supplied this system broken because they jumper it to 133 by default, which later chips were rated for, but this one doesn't even start up at this speed, so they didn't think that through. They do actually run quite cold, in fact some of the 133 MHz versions use less than 1 watt at full load, so... Yeah, that heatsink, you're probably best having it, but it's not going to do a whole lot. And that's kind of the goal with these, because if they're in a dusty environment, well, you don't really want loads of fans clogging the system up with dust. Unfortunately, I can't get the heatsink off. I, well, I could, but I'd rather not risk it, because it's on there very, very strongly. It's really just a regular-looking plastic BGA package under there, like the STPC chips were, and actually like that Silicon Motion video chip. It's not very interesting to look at. It's They're not glamorous, those things, but it'll definitely work. These particular SOCs have actually appeared on AT and ATX motherboards, intended as replacements for very old systems, but good luck finding one, and even better luck affording one if you do. I did try to buy one from a company in Florida, but their contact page was broken, and I couldn't get anyone to answer the phone. Then they redesigned their website and didn't seem to sell them anymore, but then they did and then they didn't. And Otherwise you might have been looking at that today instead of this. Uh, as they did such a sloppy job, I'm not going to name them. They didn't want my money, so I'm going to assume they don't want anybody else's. Uh, fuck them. But anyway, obviously we're not looking at that because I couldn't buy one. I guess we'd better test this thing out instead. Doesn't matter, this thing was cheaper anyway been a 486 core under the hood it means it'll operate just like a regular pc for the most part of course though the silicon motion video chip scales all of the output to 800 by 600 which is probably just because it's oriented to lcd screens rather than crts it's not the worst scaling i've ever seen nor is it the best but it's good enough for this system's intended application i mean it's it's better than what we had on the crappy dolls isn't it and to be honest, that was inexcusable, because I, I've used plenty of laptops with CNT video solutions that have way better scaling than that, so I really don't know what the hell was wrong with that thing, but yeah, the bias is a bit unusual. I mean, aside from seeing a 486 with a post-2000 copyright date, which, uh, well, it's much older than my STPC systems, but still. There are a bunch of options you don't normally see, but there are also ones which are common on real 486 boards, like timing and such, which are completely absent. You can't even read what those are set to, so you'd better hope they're decent. It's a safe bet they're probably hardwired for reliability over speed, given the intended use case for this system, and to be honest, that is for the best. Like I say, this thing isn't going to be rip-roaringly fast. It wasn't designed to be, and it doesn't need to be. Today we'll be running DOS, purely as that's what we always run, and we want some comparisons, but a system like this might not have done that. I mean, DOS is popular, in fact this comes with a, a Dr. DOS license, this thing. But, well, we already talked about QNX once, a real-time operating system. It might have run that, or it might have been running something like VXWorks. It's another real-time operating system, it's very modular, and it's very common in space. I can't operate it worth a damn though, so yeah, we're on DOS. And to be honest, it's not an unpopular choice on these things, as far as I'm aware. But how fast can we go? Well, it yeah, looks passable. Uh, so does that. Yeah, maybe not so great. I've got a bit of a bad feeling about that one. Well, th that looks alright, though. It seems okay. And I can't run Quake. Uh, I'm not sure it's the system. Because I have this problem with Quake quite often. It doesn't seem to be very well coded. Some machines it'll work on, and then it won't. And some it just never works on. I don't know. It probably wouldn't run very fast, but in our case, I'm just going to say it ran too fast for us to see, and it gave overflow points, so yeah. So, none of this really means very much on its own, but interestingly, this CPU identifies as a Cyrix DX4. Kind of like the STPCs identify as a, a non-clock doubling, or a DX2. Now, to be clear, they're definitely not the same SOC with a different badge. They're built differently, and it's quite apparent. I mean, for a start, the STPC runs on a 66 MHz bus. 
hence it's a DX2 when it's at 133 megahertz. The ZFX86, just like the original CPUs, runs on a 33 megahertz bus. I mean, it's perfectly usable, but it's a DX4 CPU in there to all intents and purposes. The STPC also had integrated graphics and a few other differences in its architecture, so yeah, they're not the same chip. It was clear where SGS got the license for the Cyrix architecture because, well, they were one of the fab Cyrix employed, and part of the agreement was they could sell Cyrix chips with their name on it, and really the STPC, I guess, was just an extension of that. ZF Micro, on the other hand, must have bought a license from somewhere at some point, and I don't know why. I mean, this thing seems to have come about at the end of the 90s, but it's hard to pin down exactly when. And, well, uh, they could have maybe have gotten one from SGS, TI, or IBM, but Cyrix was changing hands a few times at that point, and whilst they could have bought it from Cyrix, I don't know who would have been the parent company of Cyrix at that particular time, because I don't know when this thing was made. It's possible they didn't have a license for it, but I, I find that doubtful. Still, if anybody knows, then uh, do enlighten me where they got the, the license from. It doesn't matter anyway. We'll test it against an original Cyrix DX4100 CPU, and we'll use my ECS UM8810, where... Oh, no. This card uses a technology called CQM. I'm human, I make mistakes, and, well, it's, everyone else seems to be on the ball, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately I can't go back and change that. YouTube could really do with an edit feature. Still, moving on, it, actually, no, that's not yet. Here, have a schematic. I reverse-engineered the VR100. Should be quite easy to make one if you have a, an ECS board like mine and you want one. I mean, you could even feed the output into other boards that don't have volt regs on, I suppose. You just use wires. But really moving on. I'll be turning the L2 cache off on the old DX4, as like many of these SOCs, the ZFX86 only has level 1 cache. It's 8K, it's in right back mode, just like the original CPU. The Cyrix does win in 3D Bench, it's 48 versus 34.5, though I would suspect the uh, VGA card in the DX4 might be helping here, even if it's that inexcusably slow diamond one. There's no way the silicon motion chip's going to be all that fast. The turns have tabled in PC Player, though. Having said that, it's 11.6 uh, versus 11.4 in favour of the ZF. The tide has tanked in top bench back in favour of the Cyrix, 237 versus 139, but it's quite clear that the SM video chip is holding things back for the ZF, and really the results are probably quite close otherwise. CPU scores are nearly identical in speedsys, 40.56 for the ZF, but with 40.30 for the Cyrix, it seems no improvements were made to the CPU core at all, and really this is just about within the margins for error. Uh, at this time of year, the temperatures fluctuate in quite a lot with the weather, and well, that, that's actually enough to knock it by this much. And let's face it, there, there would be no reason for ZF Micro to really modify the CPU core that much beyond shrinking it down to fit in the SOC and not use much power. There's no point in tampering with it, you want it to be compatible, and it's been around a, a good while, everyone knew how it worked. Video memory for both systems is below 10 megs per second, with only around 8 for the silicon motion and 9.4 for the crappy Diamond Vision 868, but I, I mean... It's probably like, what, 20-some percent? You'll rarely find a fast VGA chip on an SOC anyway, but this PCI card in the DX4 really is terrible. I mean, that thing would be trampling this a lot harder with practically any other card, but yeah, luckily we can replace that one, and I don't care about the issue on the ZF. It's clearly not taking advantage of the faster SD RAM, because I'm in mean, like, well, uh... It tramples the memory bandwidth at 80.98, where the old DX4 comes in at 54.83, which actually is quite good for a 90s 486. Level 1 cache is close, though, 62.98 for the ZF versus 64.02 in favour of the old Cyrix. This is probably just something to do with timings or weight states, to be honest. This is very marginal. Throughput is similarly close, it's 24.70 versus 22.55, the, the ZF takes it here, but it's extremely close. D 
Doom is significantly faster on the DX4, the ZF, scraping 19.5, versus 26.7 for the old Cyrix DX4. Again, I, I'd be willing to blame the silicon motion chip, and I'm not going to bash on it, because as we established, it's not designed to go very fast, and to be honest, I think it's doing just fine. Unfortunately, the ZF Micro can't run NSSI, as I feel this would be better to demonstrate what's already apparent, that when it comes down to what's really under the hood, and especially code running on the CPU alone, there's practically nothing in it, and it seems the ZFX86 does perform on par with its granddad, the Cyrix DX4, which is what it claimed to do, so... Well, I guess it works. I'd be curious to know how it stacks up against the STPC, but I've never seen one of those at 100 MHz. Although we know how the 66 MHz version was very close to Cyrix DX2s, despite the clock multiplying not being a thing on the STPC, so it's probably safe to bet that these two SOCs perform about the same as each other. Overall, I don't think the ZF Micro is a bad SOC at all, and I'd even wager the compatibility issues I've had on mine one are just Arbor or Phoenix been a bit dodgy with their design somewhere. Plus, I doubt this sort of thing ever came up in its intended application. It wouldn't really be used for the sort of things we've thrown at it today. I mean, running Doom is not really pertinent to operating a factory production line. And that said, I don't know why, but it just doesn't appeal to me as much as the STPC systems do. It feels a little weaker somehow. It, if that makes any sense, I, I just can't quite place my finger on it. I do wonder how the 133 MHz versions hold up, but I can't see myself getting hold of one, because they cost a lot of money, and I just wouldn't really use it for anything. As the, the Cyrix 586 that we've run a DX4 into there generally does that kind of stuff for me just fine. And it's worth noting that with L2 cache, you actually do get quite a bit of a boost, uh, so yeah, uh, that's something to keep in mind. But I think that's enough, and I will pass you back over to that dickhead in front of the camera. Even though I do have a couple more things to talk about, they're pretty short, and we'll just do it there. Yeah, so that's that. To be honest, I don't think it's a bad little SOC, and I do think a lot of the problems with it are likely a design flaw with this board, or with that dodgy Phoenix bias. The disc on chip thing. Uh, luckily, I looked, and I did talk about it last time on the STPC one. Because I can't get it to work on this no matter how I configure the window. It's obviously a fault with that bias. So, yeah, I don't think it's very well written, that bias. Arbor probably didn't update for it. It seems to be... A, I believe that they, they, they updated it after that, but I, I can't be quite sure now. Uh, I can't find the manual either. I did have it, and it's vanished. Uh, there's nothing too interesting in there that I, I couldn't talk about. Uh, yeah, uh, visuals on this. I don't actually know how this is going to turn out. I'm just kind of filming uh, anywhere. Because I don't know if you'll have noticed. I mean, we had a lot of issues. Like, uh, my SD card for my camcorder failed. And so I had to use an old one and turn the quality down. But this also, it got stuck. And I've only just been able to get it out and put a good one in there again. Because it was a very slow card, the one I had to substitute. And, uh... Yeah, this has coincided with, like, the sensor. It's, like, going dim, and I've never really... I have had that happen before, but they usually go yellow fast. Like, they don't just go dark. They start going that piss yellow colour, and then everything starts going dark. Uh, the light I've got cranked as far as I can. I've got the gain cranked as far as I can on the camera, which makes the quality worse. And I'm going to have to try and drag this up a bit in Vegas, and it, it seems to be at a point now where we're going to start losing fidelity quite a lot. And that's not really good. Um, coupled with the fact that I fucking hate having to use a modern computer and it's painfully slow and stuff, I probably will replace the camera at some point, but we'll be going back to a consumer camcorder, because I'm not putting four figures into another one now, because I just don't, I haven't ended up using it often enough anyway. Uh, you know, it, I'm still glad I did. I, I've liked having this camera. It has been a good camera, but I would have expected it to last a little bit longer. You know, the... The fans in them have a finite life where a little alarm goes off on them when it, it's the counter's gone over, and I expected that would be the first thing that would break on it, not the SD card slot and the CMOS sensor. So, yeah, at least they seem to think it's CMOS. I, I can't... I don't think they really use CCD very much now, do they? So that that's not good. But anyways, something that might be good is uh, I have a laptop. 
And I, I've wanted an excuse to get one of these laptops, because I've used one before, and I, I really, really liked it, and I just couldn't find... I don't know what happened to it, to be honest. I, I still have the parts I took off and replaced with better ones, but I don't have the laptop. Well, I've got another one now, and it's the lowest-end model, so I guess, <laughs> I guess we're back where we fucking started. But, uh... Yeah, the, the excuse was because people keep talking about their fucking stink pads, and I can't stand stink pads. I think they're, they're fucking garbage. I'd rather be stuck with one than a lot of the other stuff that's out there, but I don't fucking like them. I think they're horrible. And uh, it turns out I don't actually know anyone who has the equivalent. So if you have like a ThinkPad 600, I think it would be. I don't fucking know the model numbers. are all the fucking same. Uh... Or at least like a Pentium 2 burst one, if it's like 266 or 300 megahertz, right? If you can run speedsys on that and post me uh, the results, right? Just, uh, if you've got a capture card, capture it. If you can get a PCX of it, or just take a picture of the screen with like your fucking phone or something. Uh... I'd, I'd be interested. That might end up in the, the video if you don't mind. To, to be honest, if you want to record a voiceover just like reading the results out, uh, that would be cool. I, I wouldn't mind including that in the video on the laptop. I don't know if it'll turn out faster or slower than mine. Mine's older than the ThinkPad. You'd think it'd be slower. Uh, early indications do suggest otherwise, but I'm not setting any store by that because it just doesn't seem right to me. I, I do think mine should be slower. And if you are going to do a voiceover, you feel free to do that in, like, a different language. If English isn't your first language, which you, you could totally just insult me the whole time. And I, well, I'd know, because I'd get somebody to translate it for me. <laughs> but it could be kind of amusing, couldn't it? Uh, you know, it could be kind of neat. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure I had something else. But if there is anything else, I guess we'll talk about that after the end credits. Uh, title synth noise thing. I've remembered what it is, but I've already committed now, so uh, I'm High Trees, and thanks for watching, and remember, until next time, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622 up. Aha! So what I wanted to talk about was my Prophet 5. You remember when I did that little test with it at Christmas? Uh, I noted the original tantalums were still in there from the 80s, and they weren't very well. I don't know how I got that test done with, like, the the setup I had at the time was, like, completely busted, but uh, it got done somehow. It's full of timing issues, though, isn't it? I'm going to replace those capacitors. Should I do a video on the internals of the Prophet 5? We won't be going through, like, one capacitor at a time, but we might as well have a look at the innards while we're in there. It's revision 3.2, so, you know, it's not the same as all of them, but I figure it could be interesting. There are channels where you can see the innards. There's one, I, I'm sure it was called Synth Chaser has that. Going to replace power supply as well. Capacitors in high voltages really hard to get hold of for me, and they cost a lot of money. It's actually cheaper just for me to replace the power supply with a better one, and the power supply is a bit of a weak point, so I guess we'll do that at the same time. It might as well. I mean, I don't mind spending the money because I'd rather just have it work than leave the shitty old power supply not repaired. Because I was going to just rebuild the power supply entirely or modify it. Uh, and, you know, I'd rather just pay to replace the power supply than blow up an expensive instrument. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, what is it? Prevention's cheaper than the cure, I think they say. I guess that's kind of the approach we're taking. Also, ZF Micro, their website has started working again for me, and I think it was a browser problem. That, that other company, the one in Florida, that I won't name, if you go to ZF Micro's website, I think you'll find out, because I think it mentions them, but, uh, yeah, their website's still shit. ZF Micro, are based out of California, uh, says they were founded in 2002, I don't believe that, I think they might be a bit older. And you should really read the company profile page because it's a laugh. The first thing it does is go on this rant about a lawsuit with National Semiconductor. But I guess I know now we know where they got the license from for the Cyrix 486. And uh, National apparently refused to produce them. The lawsuit went on for three years. And so these didn't come out until 2005. So I guess that explains some of the weirdness with the, the copyright dates and stuff, maybe. Uh, now they're apparently made by IBM, so IBM already would have had a license to uh, make Cyrix 486s. 
National own Cyrix for a time. I think Via owns Cyrix now. Who owns the rights to the 486? Well, you know, there's obviously still license to produce them, I guess, after that point, but uh, yeah, I wonder why that went. Who owns that property now? You should really read that page. It is a laugh. It's, it doesn't strike me as being very professional. To be honest, if I was like a board manufacturer, I don't think that would encourage me to really do business with that company, if I'm entirely honest. It, it doesn't seem very professional to me to, to have that as a first thing on your company profile. Like, hey, we sued somebody. I'm great because I won. So, but hey, you know, I guess it's worked for them, so whatever. I, I'm not a businessman. What would I fucking know? Uh, yeah, uh, well, anyways, um, <laughs> having said that, I think the other ones have probably sold better. Whatever, I've filmed this later, if you can tell. I already edited and finished the video, and then that page started working. Ah, oh, God, I better put that on the end. Uh, yeah, I'm tired now, even though the sun's only a few hours up, so I'm going to go away. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time, probably with that laptop. So, if not, video bastardizer. Sure, we'd have a look at one that can do brown and stuff. And there's better colours. Maybe someday. Not sure. I'll think about it. But I'm out of here. I've had enough. See ya.